Hello, I'm Dr. Wayne Rosen, and I'm a colon and rectal surgeon and clinical assistant professor of surgery at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. Welcome back to part four of this four-part lecture series on the shortcomings of evidence-based medicine and why it just doesn't work. This session is a response to questions and criticisms. Now, if you listened to the last lecture, you heard why and how I reached my conclusion that EBM is a misguided and ineffectual enterprise and that advances and improvements in medical care over the past several decades have not occurred because of EBM, but rather in spite of it. And if you listen to all three of the preceding lectures, you have a pretty good understanding of what led me to that conclusion. Now I know there are many questions and criticisms to my arguments and conclusions, but before addressing these, let me provide a brief summary of what led me to this point. In part one, I argued that evidence-based medicine has, in a very short time, become the dominant paradigm for how to teach, learn, and practice clinical medicine. Medical schools, residency training programs, conferences, and journals have all adopted EBM as the standard approach. In part two, I provided three examples of anomalous and inconsistent research findings and suggested that these came about as a result of a fundamental misconception, an essentially flawed assumption at the heart of the EBM paradigm. And finally, in part three, I demonstrated the fundamentally flawed assumption, what I call the fallacy of quantification, and I showed how it distorts and misrepresents medical phenomena and leads to the sorts of bizarre and peculiar outcomes we see so frequently with clinical research under the EBM paradigm. Now in this, the fourth and final part of this lecture series, I wish to address some of the common questions and criticisms which arise from my analysis. I know that there are many people who will not be convinced by my argument, and in this regard, I'm reminded of St. Anselm and the comments he made in his preface to the ontological proof for the existence of God. He said, and I paraphrase, that while he himself was completely convinced of, uh, by his proof of God, he was aware that unless you already believed in God, you might not be so convinced. In this regard, I'm aware that unless you already harbor significant doubts about the utility of, and truth of EBM, you will not necessarily be convinced by my argument. That said, I do find that a great many physicians secretly entertain doubts and suspicions about the benefits of EBM, and when I present to physicians, I'm frequently surprised by the positive response I get to my ideas. When I ask people whether they actually practice EBM, I encounter a lot of hemming and hawing, and people say things like, well, I try to, but there's not a lot of good evidence in my area. And, well, sort of, but a lot of it doesn't apply to my practice. Nobody ever responds unequivocally with a yes. I've come to believe that a great many physicians do not buy into EBM, but are wary of speaking up for several reasons. First, they're worried about being considered a Luddite if they question this new innovation. Second, they don't fully understand why EBM doesn't work and are therefore reluctant to voice a criticism of it. Third, and there is no shortage of very prominent people and institutions and journals who endorse it heartily. Given its general role as the dominant way to practice medicine, it's easy to second-guess oneself and repress any doubts. And finally, I think many physicians are just too busy to give it much thought. Everyone seems to accept it, so it must be okay. Now let me respond to some of the questions and criticisms which you undoubtedly have. The first question which usually comes up is, hey, are you seriously suggesting that clinical research is bogus and we should just give up doing it? My response to this is an unequivocal no. On the contrary, we should double down on research, but we cannot pretend that studying complex medical phenomena the way we have been studying it is actually working. It is far too crude a tool. If we think that we can quantify quality of life, quality of colonoscopy, degree of incontinence, extent of infection with any more nuance than we can slice a strawberry with a chainsaw, then we are fooling ourselves. The models and tools which we use to quantify complex phenomena do not make our studies more objective. They just lend them a facade, a veneer of objectivity, but what's underneath is not really very pretty. Now the second question people frequently ask are, are you suggesting that all research that has gone before is useless, that the massive industry of investigative clinical medicine has accomplished nothing, that past and present clinical trials are all a complete waste of time and money? Well, the short answer to this is 
No, not entirely. They're not a complete waste of time and money. Uh, and I do not suggest that we close down all clinical research. But appreciating what I am suggesting does not mean that we dispose of all quantitative clinical research, but it does change the way that we perceive it. Consider the analogy of geocentrism, which I used in the first lecture. When Copernicus and Galileo convinced the general scientific public that the Earth was not the center of the universe, it did not change what people actually observed. They still saw the sun and the moon and other celestial bodies move across the sky, like it did before, but it did change profoundly how they saw things, how they interpreted the phenomena. And it opened up a new understanding of how the planets moved. So it is with this discussion of EBM. Appreciating the fallacy of quantification does not necessarily change what we see in the medical liter literature, but it does profoundly change how we interpret it and how we understand it. We regard the results of studies with a very different mindset. We can understand why there is so much variability and discrepancy of results. We understand why medical treatments seem to come and go almost like fads. We understand why there is so much nonsensical and bogus research out there dealing with everything from cleanses to weight loss regimens. It helps us understand the Dr. Oz's of this world. We are more thoughtful about statements like the one from, a, from Woodson Merrill suggesting that there is evidence to show that people who live a more connected life tend to live longer and more fulfilled lives. Removing the specious veil of objectivity helps to explain what can only be described as the malleability, the plasticity of clinical research in the hands of commercial interests. We are no longer surprised by so much variability in results. We actually come to expect it. Now, question number three, what about all the examples of research which appear to lead to better patient care? What about a trial like NSABP06, which has changed the way we treat breast cancer? Now, there is a general belief that improvements in medical care proceed directly from clinical research, that a given study shows a positive outcome, and that clinical practice then adopts this as the standard. A classic example of this would be the NSABP06 study on breast cancer. Some of you may recall that this was a big randomized trial which appeared to change our thinking about doing mastectomies for breast cancer. It compared segmental mastectomy with and without radiation treatment versus total mastectomy and showed that there was no difference with regard to local recurrence. Now there's a tendency to think that the reason we treat many women nowadays with segmental mastectomy and radiation instead of with a total mastectomy is because of NSABP06. But I would argue that it is not because of NSABP06. We treat, women this, we treat women this way because it actually works in practice. Because when we have treated a lot of women with segmental mastectomy and RT, they do well and do not get a whole whack of local recurrences. What is the difference, you may be asking? Well, in many ways, clinical medicine functions a great deal like a marketplace. Treatments come and go all the time, but the marketplace of medical care eventually sorts out what really works. The reason we treat breast cancer with segmental mastectomy and RT is because the marketplace of medicine tried it out and found it acceptable. It worked in practice. How do I know this, you may ask? Well, because we've all witnessed countless studies uh, which show a benefit for a given intervention and which, when adopted by physicians, just do not pan out. The fistula plug treatment, which I mentioned in part two of this lecture series, is a classic example of this phenomenon. Despite the positive results, it soon became clear that the marketplace of practitioners just found that it did not work and it subsequently uh, crumbled away. This may sound counterintuitive, but it actually makes quite a bit of sense. First, the reason why a study is done in the first place is because there's a general feeling that a specific intervention might work best. In the case of NSABP06, the idea of a segmental mastectomy in RT did not arbitrarily come out of thin air. There was plenty of skepticism out there regarding the effectiveness of total mastectomy, and it was clear that people had been experimenting with segmental mastectomy for some time uh, uh, before NSABP06, else the idea of doing a study in the first place would never have come up. When the results appear to show comparable outcomes for women with segmental mastectomy and radiation versus women with total mastectomy, there were some holdouts initially in the area of total mastectomy, but over time, most surgeons adopted segmental mastectomy with RT, and it became the de facto standard of care. There were also some external factors contributing to this, such as a desire on the part of both physicians and women to avoid disfiguring surgery, but the real reason why it has remained 
uh, the standard of care and why we still treat women, women with segmental mastectomy and RT is not because of NSABP06. It is because segmental mastectomy and RT worked in practice. Surgeons and oncologists who treated these patients did not find a whole bunch of bad recurrences or complications, and women seemed quite satisfied with the results of preserving their breasts. The trial NSABP06 undoubtedly had some influence on the process, but was by no means the decisive one. There is a complex interplay, an essential tension between the clinical evidence and practice of medicine, which leads to retention of new practices. I know this may not seem terribly scientific, and perhaps even a little bit disappointing, but it is the way medicine really works, and given the inherent unreliability of most quantitative research, it's not actually such a bad thing to let the market sort it out. Let me be clear, I do believe that quantitative research plays a role, but it is not a simple straightforward process such as a, a given study shows X works better than Y, therefore we all do X over Y. On the contrary, there is a give and take between clinical research and the market of medical practice. Anyone who has practiced clinical medicine for more than 10 years will recognize the following pattern. A new medical intervention or approach is studied which shows great promise. We all jump on the bandwagon and try it out. After a while it loses favor among physicians who find it just doesn't seem to hold up in clinical practice. Then we all start to disembark from the bandwagon and then repeat studies are carried out showing that the treatment really isn't very effective and we all agree to abandon it. Eventually the treatment fades away and becomes a historical footnote. There are no end of novel studies which appear to revolutionize the management of various conditions, but the vast majority of them disappear after a few years in spite of their initial promise. Why? Because the marketplace of medical practice found that, in spite of the studies, the treatment or intervention just didn't work in the real world. And we now understand why the initial studies may have been so promising, even though they subsequently flamed out in practice. This is because the quantification of medical phenomena is such a crude tool which misrepresents and distorts the phenomena we are exploring. What happens invariably in these scenarios is that studies then come out contradicting the original studies and ultimately show that the intervention does not work very well. This was the case with the fistula plug. It's a classic chicken-egg problem. What comes first, the chicken of research or the egg of practice? Now, one final comment in this regard. There's an old adage in medicine which many of you will undoubtedly have heard at some point. Never be the first to adopt a new treatment and never be the last. At the core of this adage is, the market, is a marketplace analogy. When a treatment comes out, no matter how promising it may be, don't jump on the bandwagon till it's proven itself in the marketplace. Now, moving on to a, another common question. You might be wondering, so what do you propose? What does this mean as far as medical practices going forward? If not EBM, then what? Well, to start, one could consider opening up the spectrum of acceptable evidence to include qualitative evidence. Instead of trying to quantify someone's quality of life or severity of incontinence with a numerical tool, we could consider discussing these issues in qualitative or narrative terms. We could open up and legitimize expert opinion and experience again. We could consider creative and alternate approaches to investigating various medical interventions. For example, if interested whether a given chemotherapeutic agent or regimen of therapeutic agents is better, one could actually consider asking the investigators their opinion and their experiences, the patient too for that matter. One could even consider dropping the facade of blindedness and randomization in certain studies. Instead of treating bias as the enemy, one could even embrace it. I know these ideas run completely counter to the generally accepted doctrines of modern clinical research, but we may be surprised by what they reveal. Now, question five, another criticism which frequently comes up is to point out that this is a straw man argument because what I'm really taking to task is clinical research and not evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine in this regard just represents an approach to evaluating and interpreting the research. It teaches critical appraisal of the results of research, but it is not research itself. The real adversary of my comments should be the research enterprise. This is partially true, except that the effect of EBM is one of unintended consequences with regard to research. Because EBM determines the criteria for what constitutes good research, it has had the unintended consequence 
or effect of significantly determining how most research is done. For example, if students assigned an essay are told that they will be evaluated primarily on their use of large, complicated words, you can be pretty sure that there will be a, a copious proliferation of polysyllabic compositions. And so it is with EBM. By determining the criteria for what constitutes good research, they determine, in effect, how the research will be done. It is an example of the tail of EBM wagging the dog of research. To some extent, and staying with the theme of religion, you could say that EBM is like a deity which has created research in its own image. Now, question or criticism six. If you, even if you concede that there might be some merit to the argument here, what about bias and research? One of the key aspects of EBM is to, deter, to detect bias and undue influence on the research process. Now, bias in research is a fascinating topic. Early in his career, Sackett, one of the fathers of EBM, had catalogued 57 types of bias in analytic research. This number, by the way, 57, coincidentally corresponds to the old Heinz logo of 57 varieties, and perhaps Dr. Sackett, Sackett might have even had a greater impact if he'd pursued that line of marketing. Nowadays, however, I suspect that one might publish these results as a compendium of bias in a clinical research with a more arousing title like Fifty Shades of Bias, undoubtedly quite a stimulating read. But on a more serious note, bias is considered the evil arch nemesis of all clinical research. There is so much effort spent trying to stamp it out that we rarely ask ourselves what it tells us about the entire enterprise of clinical research. It is like crime in society. We are so busy trying to stamp it out that we rarely ask ourselves what it tells us about the nature of our society, about social inequality and education, about opportunity, injustice, alienation, and ignorance. If we step back for a moment and consider the overall concept of bias in clinical research, we can infer one or two things right away, and that is that clinical research is not a terribly objective enterprise. Do you think that physicists and chemists and most bench, bench researchers double blind, carry out double-blind randomized controlled trials? Do you think that scientists assessing whether eggs stick to a new polymer that's coating a frying pan do randomized trials? The preoccupation with bias in EBM tells us right away that we are dealing with a deeply subjective enterprise. In fact, almost everything we need to know about bias is evident in the concept of the placebo effect. The placebo effect screams out the deeply subjective nature of clinical research. When you stop and think about what it means, the placebo effect tells us that individuals, physicians, patients, and nurses cannot even interpret how they feel or what they observe with any degree of objectivity. We have to put blinders on them so they won't distort their own impressions. I mean, frankly, clinical science seems to have more in common with political science than, say, physics or chemistry. Now, Undoubtedly, many other questions and criticisms uh, are, exist, but I will address one last one before concluding. Some people have pointed out that throughout this argument, I don't seem to provide much evidence for my position, but use lots of analogies. It's more like the argument from analogy, they say. And to this, I would say, quite true. I do not provide much evidence, at least not as it's typically construed in quantitative EBM terms. But there are, and there are two reasons for this. First, I really don't believe most people are convinced by evidence anyway. I think we tend to use evidence to support our beliefs and discount it when it doesn't do so. You may think this is cynical, but I don't think so. I think that there is a very complicated to and fro, back and forth reverberation between belief and evidence. We can and do change our beliefs, but it, is usually, but it usually occurs gradually, almost imperceptibly, and much like uh, the way a massive ocean liner turns about at sea. The second reason I have presented the way I have is that I believe people are more influenced by a compelling narrative, a story of sorts, which gives context and explains their experiences. And I hope these lectures have provided this. I have tried to show in these series of lectures that at the heart of evidence-based medicine lies a fundamental misconception, a misguided assumption about the nature of clinical research, what I've called the fallacy of quantification. I've tried to show that quantifying complex medical phenomena is a crude and inexact process which leads to all sorts of strange results and outcomes. I can appreciate that there is something very comforting, almost seductive in the process of quantifying complex phenomena and making it appear neat and tidy in order to facilitate measurements. 
but it is important to remember that a great deal of information and phenomena was discounted and ignored in order to make this neat and tidy. Regardless how neat and tidy things ultimately look, the measurements are only as good as the tool it uses. Now, there's an old anecdote about a man who is standing around a light pole in night, at night looking for his car keys. A second fellow comes along and offers to help, and together they both look for his car keys under the light. After about 30 minutes, the second fellow asks the first fellow, Are you really sure you lost your keys here? I mean, we've been looking for half an hour uh, without any success. To which the first fellow, pointing to a darkened alley, alley, alleyway, responds, Oh no, I lost them way down that dark alley, but since there's no light there, I figured it wasn't worth looking. If the only light we use is the light of quantification, then there are lots of things we'll never find. Thank you for your attention.